Hey, what's up guys? This is Rudy here. Well, this is going to be the first episode of Shop of 2020, so Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, hello, to a VIP in English school. Hello, talking to EFL. In a moment, we're going to join Andre Hetland. Just in a minute, okay, here. Andre, for our good friend, Andre. So, guys, again, Happy New Year for those who uh, I haven't seen yet. Oh, hi. Whoa, that was fast. Hey, what's up, dude? Can you hear what me is, okay? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you well. I think this is the first time. You're not, wait a minute, are you wearing some headphones or earphones? Oh, you, you're yeah, not, I oh, am, oh, I am. Okay. Yeah, not, not, not the other ones, yeah, but I am. <laughs> Don't worry right. about it. <laughs> All right, so we're back, huh? Okay, we're back. First shop pedagogical of the year, right? Yeah, I was just wishing Happy New Year for those who I haven't seen or haven't talked to yet. Oh, yeah. So, Happy New Year, everyone, you know. But I hope we have a great one. It's the first <laughs> episode. Time. It's the first episode, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and we're going to talk about some interesting stuff, right? Oh, definitely. And most actually, definitely. you know, since it's the first episode, I'm going to drink tea the British way. I know you hate it. Oh, uh, not with But I got milk, some man. milk. Oh. So, I got some milk. Oh, man. I got some Earl Grey. Oh, man. <laughs> Come on, So, man. yeah. Oh, that's man. how they do it in the UK, man. Yeah. I know that's how they do that. Come on. Oh, man. Okay, so I cheers. Actually, I got used to it. I don't know. Cheers. Cheers. For some reason, I got used to it. It was, you know, actually, before I moved there, mm -hmm. I would never drink tea like that. But then, I don't know, somebody just said, this is how you're supposed to drink here. Like, okay. <laughs> I'll give it a try. And, and I ended up liking it. I, I think I did something wrong when I was living in, in, in Scotland because instead of knowing, learning how to drink tea, I learned how to drink whiskey. Maybe. <laughs> sure. I think, well, that, that can happen there, you know. Yeah, I think. They, <laughs> the they, land they were... of Scotch. Well, <laughs> I wouldn't expect anything less, you know. <laughs> I think there was something wrong with me while I was living there. But anyway. All right, guys. So, once again, <laughs> sure. welcome to this first episode of Shopping the Galeshko, the first episode of the year. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We're going welcome, to discuss. Welcome, welcome. We're going to discuss a lot of uh, cool stuff. Hopefully, this is going to be adult very cool. learning. Adult learning, yes. yes. And uh, just to remind you guys, uh, if you cannot watch us till the end of this episode today, or if you uh, followed us from the mid part to the end, don't forget that we this episode is going to be available on the podcast this week. Yeah, um, we're going to post it. We're going to upload it to to Spotify. So. Don't, yep. don't kill yourselves. Oh, my God, I missed that. Don't worry. It's going to be on Spotify, and it's <laughs> also worry. going to be on IGTV here. Uh, IGTV, either, exactly. Either here at uh, Machiello's account hello, or, hello. EDC Rec, or EDC Rock's account. So it's going to be on either these accounts. But Spotify and IGTV yep. for sure. Awesome. <clears throat> all right. So, so welcome, uh, everyone. Good to see you around. Good to see you all. Uh, we're going to discuss adult learning this uh, in this episode. And um, I, was, yes. I was reading, uh, well, for those who have been following us, um, I've been studying a lot yes. the research is by Ev, Professor Eva Dabrowska. She's a linguist. She's a cognitive linguist. And uh, she has a book on mind and brain in linguistics. Yeah. And uh, I've been reading her book, and it's an amazing book. And um, I, I, I was kind of like revisiting the differences between yeah. a kid's brain and the adult's brain, because this is exactly. pretty much this is pretty much the whole not, not the whole talk, but there's yeah. there's there's so many. I, so I many got chapters. my master's notes here, man. <laughs> my well, master's I, course, you know, I my, actually got my, the notes here. Yeah. My notes are here. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Awesome. Awesome. But like you said, this, this is something, this is something important, right? The difference <laughs> between a kid's brain and yeah. an adult's brain, right? And that, yeah. it's, it's quite different if you think in terms of cognitive development, right? Exactly. So two things that, that I wanted to sort of focus on is that kids are going through a period of synaptogenesis. Basically, they're creating a lot of synapses. And synapses are 
the small gaps between the neurons where there's a lot of exchange of information, right? It could be electrically or it could be chemically. So it depends on, on what kind of information the brain is trying to send. But the idea is that the brain is trying to find its best format, its best shape, right? And uh, we have to go through a period of making more than we need, basically. That's the idea, making more synapses than we need. And we have uh, from, uh, you know, newly born babies still around six years old, they're going through this period. So when they hit like two, three years old, they're going through a period that we call the exuberant period. So they're making a lot of uh, connections, like many more than we can do as adults. We stop doing that. But, you know, there are advantages and disadvantages, right? Because our brains, uh, you know, supposedly, I guess, they should be better tuned. They should be, you know, we, we were able to cut the, the weeds out. And so there is another process called neuro pruning, which is, okay, we've experienced enough. So the brain knows, uh, you know, the best, let's say, uh, format of connections and how many connections are necessary. So this is the, the final format. Of course, we can always make new connections. That's why we say the, the brain is plastic. But mm -hmm. the idea is we're going to have around 86 billion neurons. Each neuron can connect 10,000 times with different neurons and things like that. But that's what our brain is going to be like for the rest of our lives, basically, right? Yeah. Yes. And uh, it, it, this is very interesting because uh, th this basic difference between the brain of a kid and the brain of, of, a, of our adult students, uh, this is also yeah. going to have a huge impact, of course, on the way that each learns the language. Okay. Uh, Most instance, definitely. Yeah. Exactly. For example, uh, we've been talking about uh, exposure, that exposure is key if it wants to achieve a very high proficient mark in uh, second language, the quality of exposure is uh, a very important uh, factor. Uh, and uh, yeah. as I mentioned earlier, well, shortly earlier, of, actually, uh, <laughs> yeah. Professor Eva Dabrowska in her book, she uh, cites um, a study by uh, Huggins from 1964, 1964, okay. like a long time yeah. ago. But it was a very long interesting time ago. study. Yes, but it was a very interesting study. Why was that a very interesting study and key study? Because um, Huggins found out in his study that um, adults have, uh, in a normal conversation, they learn around, yeah. around a hundred, and they learn no, they are exposed to around 150 words per minute. Yeah. Per minute, nine thousand wow. words per hour. Nine thousand words per hour. This is this is a yeah. lot in in an hour. This is a this, lot, definitely. Yeah. This is this is really really a lot. So considering these two uh, biological differences or neurological differences that we have in both brains, yeah. When we are considering learn, uh, the adult learning, when we're considering the strategies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and the exposure, we have to remember yeah. that when they are learning a second language, they are going to be uh, maybe more anxious because in their native language, they are, going to, they are used to being exposed to 9,000 words per hour. Exactly. So I, you know, it would be very interesting. Input. I mean, think about nowadays with all the, the information that we have, this era of technology. It might be even more nowadays, right? But uh, the the amount of words we're exposed to, right? <laughs> think about it. For sure. But this no, is this is. Sure, no. Yeah, and 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 this is interesting because if you think in terms of brain power. And that's what a lot of parents and, and coordinators and teachers, they use that as a justification for, you know, enroll your kids as soon as possible because they're going to learn. Uh, it, it is true in terms because, you know, they have more brain power to acquire things, right? Yeah. So if you think about uh, uh, the stimuli that they receive from the environment, they have a lot of processing power because they're kind of building 
some of, of the fundamentals of the brain, right? Yeah. On the other hand, like you said, adults, they have been exposed to so many words and so many different situations and contexts that they have much more prior knowledge than kids, and they can mm -hmm. refer to that when they're learning. Yes. So they, uh, and this is a very big difference because kids... Uh, we use this this uh, term that I don't like very much, but it's like a clean slate, right? Oh, yeah. Kids are like a tabula rasa or whatever. Yeah. It's not like that, but they're more than adults if you think about it. You know, oh, adults sure. they have more prior knowledge, right? Yes, because if you consider, and we can use that. Yes, because if you consider that the, this data that I've just talked about, this is for in an adult normal conversation, a normal adult conversation. Yeah. Now, if we consider a normal. Uh, children conversation, ch child conversation, this is, yep. they're not going to be exposed to that uh, rich vocabulary. Because, most let's definitely, say, yeah. Because, let's say, a normal kid conversation is going to be like a five year old talking to a six year old or a four year old or another five year yeah. old. So, they don't yeah. have enough background, enough linguistic background to have a very rich conversation in terms of um, lexicon, for instance. So of yeah. course the number is going to be exactly. is going to be lower, you know. And of course that's and why or yep. um, role as teachers or roles of caregivers they are, they are very important because we're responsible for creating or actually uh, improving this repertoire that our kids are going to have so that when they reach the adult phase, yes, they are going to exactly. have they're going to be okay with this nine thousand hours per 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 hour. And uh, uh, just to conclude yep. that this is an, another number which is amazing. In a normal adult conversation yeah. <laughs> per week, huh? In one week, in yep. one week, adults are going to mm. be exposed to around around five hundred thousand yeah. words in one week. Well, uh, yeah, that that's a lot. Is, imagine, <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're not going yeah. to talk, we're not getting into um, cognitive load here, okay? By the way, yep. this, is, this is something that is going to be uh, part of the PCE and uh, BTIC in July for my brain and education. So if you don't follow the SIG, my brain yeah. and education guys, follow the SIG. And please, please do, yeah. Join the PCE, which is, this is, uh, these are the, um, uh, the courses that are going to be given uh, kind of like yeah. before the, the pre-conference event. events, yeah. right? You know, yeah. and uh, we're going to talk about, they're going to talk about uh, cognitive load, among other yeah. stuff. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there as well. We're going to be there. And hopefully all <laughs> we're going to be there. Exactly. And, yeah. and uh, by the way, uh, we might actually present uh, a <laughs> pedagogy yeah. there. I mean, that's all we are allowed to say anyway. Fingers Keep rolling, man. Keep rolling. So yeah. imagine, yes, because yeah. if you consider that, uh, again, let's not talk about cognitive load. But imagine the load that an adult is going to receive with 500,000 yeah. words per week. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's it's a, a lot. lot. That's a yeah. lot of input. Okay? That is a lot. And then yeah. if we consider this, so let's suppose that this is going to be the input that a, kid, that a normal adult is going to have. And their native language, yep. okay? This is all about native language. But then we're going to have, to, if we're teaching them a second language, we'll, we'll yep. need to um, kind of like get close to this number because they're used to be exposed to this number, okay? Uh, yeah. And we need, to be sh we need to be careful not to um, overload their cognition. <laughs> Cognitive though, overload. Because even, yeah. though, even though they're used to being exposed to a lot of words per hour, per week, et yeah. cetera, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. uh, the system, the mechanism that, that we yeah. use when we're uh, learning a second language learning, yeah. is um, it, it requires a bigger effort. So exactly. we have to be and very that brings us, yeah. That brings us to, to a very important difference in, uh, in terms of memory systems that we have as kids and as adults, right? Yep. So if you look at some of the um, you know, uh, neuroscience books that I've studied, for example, there's this guy called Gazzaniga. I think he's Italian, mm -hmm. Gazzaniga or whatever. <laughs> so if you look, there's a kind of a diagram, like a sort of a flow chart 
with very different memory systems. And then you have, on one side, you have what he calls uh, conscious memory, which, um, you know, so you can make conscious effort to access that kind of memory. Mm -hmm. On the other side, you have the unconscious memory, right? Mm -hmm. But before that, you have short-term memory. Uh, Even before that, you have sensory memory, short-term memory with with working memory, and then you have long-term memory, and then it gets divided into conscious and unconscious. And then conscious memory, one of the the types that you have is called declarative memory, Mm -hmm. which is basically stuff that we can verbalize, stuff that we can declare. Yeah. And then on the other side, unconscious memory, you have one memory called procedural memory that is stuff that we can do or stuff that we normally do without thinking. It's basically uh, automatized, mm-hmm. like, you know, walking, making tea, or whatever, doing the things that we do, like, out of habit, like brushing our teeth, riding mm-hmm. a bike, and stuff like that. So what we know... For sure now. I don't like to say for sure because science keeps changing. <laughs> but what we know what, evidence, what you, right? but what you said, <laughs> but but what you said is correct. Know that we know kids, for now. Yeah. Yeah, you know, <laughs> exactly, right? But but so w- what I was saying is that kids they have uh this procedural memory system sort of strengthened or I would say they use that more than adults for a very simple reason, because, you know, adults have acquired or have been exposed to a lot of different contexts and and, and, and experiences and words. So when you say that adults are being uh, exposed to hundreds of thousands of words in a week, but they've been uh, going through that for a very long time. Oh yeah. And because of this repetition, this, you know, retrieval, or recycling of words. That's why we know, uh, we don't know all of those words, but we know most of them if they are in our native language. Mm -hmm. And uh, whereas kids, they didn't have time to be exposed to all of that for a very long time. And their brains are still forming. And uh, one specific, very particular part of the brain is still forming. And it's called the frontal lobe, mm-hmm. where we, f- we can find the prefrontal cortex, right? Yeah. So that's why we are still teenagers up to <laughs> 27 or 30 <laughs> years. Old. We're still, because that's how long it takes for us to form. The <laughs> so we were teenagers till like a couple of years ago. We're, I think we still are teenagers. But anyway, not women. this is very not important. Be- they get more, they get, they mature, <laughs> they mature way before much, us. Much faster, much faster. That, that's true. But the thing is, if, if we know that, we know that adults, they will use strategies that will help them learn or acquire vocabulary faster, yeah. in a way. Yeah. Because it's go- they're going to access or make use of their conscious memory more easily than kids. And kids, they can learn the, the mechanics of language, the structure and the chunks, that's why we normally teach. We should teach everyone with chunks, right? Yes, but yes. for kids, it's even more important yeah. for kids because that's how they learn through models and, you know, and uh, basically the, the, the structure of something. Yes. And we have to be aware of, of things like that when we're teaching kids and adults, right? Yes, of course. And, uh, you know, uh, going back to what you have just said about uh, the procedural memory and declarative memory and all these things. Uh, Professor Eva Dabrowska yeah. mentions also something very interesting in her book that the difference between compute words, computing words and storing yep. words, okay? What's, uh, the yes. bi- what's the big difference that we have? And uh, this is, then I'm, I'm, I'm coming back to the difference between long-term, short-term memory and adults, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Basically, when you store a word, you learn, you get the word, the word is in our brains, yep. kind of like you open the drawer, yep. keep it there. Whenever you need it, you get the, the word. You can find it. You, you get the word, you open the drawer, and you get the yep. word, and you use it. That's the story of a word, of a, of a, of a yeah. linguistic feature. Computing a, a, a linguistic feature is different because you have to reason over what you have just been exposed to. So basically, yeah. for example, if you... If you see the word, if, you, if a learner is exposed to the word mug, let's suppose yep. that this, this learner, I'm not considering 
adults or, or kids or whatever, learners in yeah. general. Uh, this, this learner is going to store the word mug, okay? Yeah. But let's use uh, the word love, an abstract word, okay? This word requires yeah. reasoning. And when you have to, like, okay, what? Uh, it's going to sound weird. It's going to be like a reference of a, of, of a song. But yeah. the, 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 what is love? <laughs> okay. Baby, word, don't hurt me. Oh, is that the word? Don't do hurt it. me. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I posted that I like it. this week, you know? I knew yeah. it, man. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I by it. the way, the kid who answered that on the test, I give him a 10. He, he deserves a 10, you know? Yeah, he deserves a 15. <laughs> he deserves credit for next semester, you know? Yeah. But uh, <laughs> yes. then, the, then the, yeah, the, the, the learner is going to ask, what is love? So when the student uh, basically questions, uh, question, what is yeah. a, a linguistic feature? It involves reasoning. It involves higher functions. So yeah. now... And again, in the prefrontal cortex, right? Exactly. Which is not entirely developed, yes. Exactly. So going yeah. back to the difference, uh, that short-term memory and uh, long-term memory, okay? Uh, basically, uh, this is also uh, what uh, Professor John ba Bybee says in one of her books, and William Kraft also says in one of his studies. Um, <sighs> everything starts with a short-term memory. It's there, because that's, oh, yeah. the, that's the first... It is there. Um, in a very uh, simplistic way... That's the very first behavior we have. We store yep. things. So mug, we put it in the drawer. Great. And then yep. as we keep recycling this word, as we keep being exposed to this word, hearing this word here and there, blah, 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 blah. Yep. Then we start reasoning. Okay. Most definitely. Is that a mug? Because when we start asking, is yep. that a mug? What is a mug? When a kid says, oh, but dad, is that a mug too? Mom, is that a mug too? Teacher, is that about yeah. to, there's reasoning involved. And then it's not going to be just stored. The word mug is not going to be just stored. It's going to be uh, computed. And then yeah. there's a big chance that this word or this linguistic feature is having the transition, is getting the transition, the transition from short-term memory to long-term To long-term. But and when, it comes, to, when yeah. it comes to adults, and when it comes to adults, uh, they are not necessarily going to store a word because they already have their native language consolidated. That, that's yeah. why it's sometimes so hard to make them understand some concepts or some, uh, some definitions of specific words or chunks, mainly yeah. chunks, mainly chunks. E even concrete examples like mug, you know, yes. and you said something very important. It all starts with the short uh, term memory. We can even expand that to the working memory. We know, <laughs> for example, that people who have some sort of working memory uh, deficiency or condition, they, you know, that affects their lives deeply. They cannot, they don't know who they are sometimes, or they don't know even how to do very basic things. Because we have to bring all our schema, our schemata back, everything that we know, all our prior knowledge back to the working memory mm -hmm. to do anything, basically. Yeah. And we also have to use the working memory as the main entry door for everything that we learn through our senses. And then when you look at a mug, a mug is a concrete object. So you're going to have some occipital lobe activation you're going to hear the word. You're going to have some temporal lobe activation and all over the brain. When you hear the word love and what is love, I'm not going <laughs> to sing it again, but <laughs> it's very abstract. <laughs> and if even, you know, nowadays, Piaget still very important, yeah. some, somewhat controversial for neuroscience because of the stages of cognitive development, right? Mm -hmm. But we can use that mm -hmm. to, to think that very... Uh, young learners, they cannot, they don't have the capacity to do any abst abstract thinking, if you think about it. Yeah. So it's very hard to, even though we, we see cute, uh, you know, uh, memes and stuff on the internet, 
yeah. kids defining love much better than adults, you know? What yeah. is love? And then <laughs> love is some when somebody gives you a coxinha or whatever, yeah. like something like that. They, they define love in a very cute way, yeah. kind of makes sense. But really, they cannot write a thesis or write a dissertation or or really explore the meaning of this word, right? Because they don't have this ability, this capacity to do abstract thinking. Yes. That's why we have to go into something that is called andragogy that I talked a little about, mm -hmm. which is how do adults learn? And so there are different things that we have to take into consideration when we're teaching kids and adults, right? Yes. Yes, absolutely right. Um, and uh, considering that, um, well, you said something really important yeah. a couple of um, minutes ago, that we need to teach yeah. chunks. And this is really yes. important. Why? If we go back to our native language, we learn languages through prefab, pre, this is a very hard, prefabricated <laughs> chunks. Prefabricated, yes. That's, prefabricated, that's a, that's awesome. a tongue twister. Huh? <laughs> See, that's what the Chinese did in a couple of days, you know? They built two hospitals with prefabricated parts, right? Exactly. So it works. Exactly. So let's, let's yeah. just analyze, just very briefly, what's a prefabricated chunk? A prefabricated chunk is basically like, uh, I'm sorry, how are you doing? Nice to meet you. These are basically prefabricated yeah. chunks, uh, or the chunks yeah. that are there, they are immune. Well, not immutable, but kind of, it, it's kind of immutable because, come on, you're not going to yeah. change how you're doing. You're not going to change. I'm They're sorry. kind of fixed. They're yes. fixed. Yes. Right? Sort so of. Yeah. We, live, yep. we acquire, we learn language through these prefabricated chunks. <clears throat> and then if we consider yep. adults, because they already know this chunk. They already know that in Portuguese, for example. They yeah, already they know do. that in, in their native language. Okay, so what we have to do, we have to uh, basically demonstrate, make them understand that they already know that, yeah. and they have to yes. only connect that to that exactly. prefabricated chunk in English, for instance. Yeah, you know. So yeah. this at, is at the neural level. Yeah, oh. that that's what she said. Where Everything okay with you, man? You. you you oh, went okay. dark now. Yeah, okay. yeah, I'm back. <laughs> You're back. Yeah, I don't know what happened. <laughs> but you said, <laughs> so connecting, that's important. Like prefabricated chunks, they already have their, that in their prior knowledge. So basically what your brain needs to do is to connect, to add a path or a connection in this neuronal network that you have, right? Yes. So you already know how to say that in Portuguese or whatever your first language is. Now you have to do it in English. So you just have to add a connection. But the thing is, it doesn't just happen. It takes time and exposure, right? Sometimes things do happen very, pretty much there, right? It's almost instant. <laughs> like, oh, okay, this is very cool. Mm -hmm. I've, I've always wanted to know that. Mm -hmm. So you have a, an emotional attachment to that. And then it happens like that. It clicks, but most right? of the time you have, exactly. You have to go back and go back and go back for a period of time so that it's part of your network now. And you can use uh, the chunk both in Portuguese or in English. It's much easier when the chunk is exactly the same in both languages, like, mm -hmm. you know, because you can actually literally translate and then it's the, the exact same thing and then it's easier. That's why we can still, we have, I'd say to use L1 sometimes because it really makes things easier for us in the classroom, right? Oh, definitely. And, uh, and of course, when we talk about using the use of L1 in the classroom, we have to be careful. This is, guys, we're not saying, let's make something very clear. We're not saying that <laughs> yes. you have to start communicating Portuguese with your students. That's not what we're saying, okay? Yeah. But it depends yeah. on, the, on the goal. If your goal is something, okay, this is, some, this is something that has to be very fast, very quick, uh, then yes, just, okay, uh, yeah. teacher, what's the meaning of ubiquitous? Okay, that's it. That's blah, blah, blah. Oh, teacher, what's the meaning? What is love? Let's use that again. What is love? <laughs> I'm not going to sing. No, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's what we're talking about because then it's going to click. It all depends on yep. the goal of your activity. But uh, exactly. if we, if we uh, go back to adult learning, uh, the, mechanism, yep. the, the mechanism is not so simple when they're being exposed to a, a second language 
English in this case. Why is that so simple? Yeah. Because when they are being exposed to the language, they have to first decode the language because they are being exposed to that. Yeah. So they have to decode that. And when I say decode, yeah. they, there, there are some many, so many subcategories. Uh, for instance, they'll have to translate it, you know, air quotes for those who are listening to us on Spotify. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm having air quotes yeah. here, okay? Uh, yes. They'll have to translate. They'll have to translate that. And why is why is that? Because it's a second language. So they'll have to. Okay, yep. what's the meaning of this? What's the meaning of that? Is this a chunk? If that's a chunk, if that's a collocation, if that's an idiom, uh, they'll have to. Okay, so it's. I cannot translate it sep separately. I have to translate it as a big chunk. And then exactly. there's the pragmatic effect. What's the pragmatic effect? Uh, is is yeah. there ambiguity? What's the guy, what's the person's intention? What's the locator intention yeah. when the, this person exactly. is saying this? So all these things are happening in their brain. And then as they are being exposed to that, they also need to create and design what they are going to say or what our students are going to say to keep the conversation going. And come on, guys, I'm being yep. extremely superficial and simplistic here. Of course, there sure. are so many subcategories here, but just so you have yep. uh, an idea of what is going on in the brain of red adult students, okay? Uh, because Most definitely, yeah. All because they already have their first language consolidated, you know? So, yeah, and that's... Go. Yep. But, but yeah, that's, that's a key aspect. So uh, we've been talking about some very important differences. And so we've uh, agreed that kids, they use much more a different memory system when compared to adults, which is the procedural memory system. And adults, they use more the declarative memory system, which is basically concepts, ideas, words, you know, like lexicon, if you, if you will. And uh, it's easier for them to learn things like that because they have a lot of prior knowledge to fall back uh, into onto and then refer to that and use that to learn a language in a much more conscious way. And then, like I said, so there, there are theories, there are authors discussing how adults should learn more. Mm -hmm. And then I, I actually got seven, actually a couple of principles, like five or six principles from this sort of science. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure I can call it a science. Ah, come on, I yes. won't call it a, no, it's a, a pseudoscience because I think it's, it's science, valid. Man. It's a science. But it, it, Wait a minute. it is a science. My master's is master's of science. I believe your master is master's of science. You don't have an it is field, right? so we so So, yep. So we are scientists in a way, aren't we? Yeah, so that's a good a point. So, it's a science, man. <laughs> it is a science. <laughs> so this is something that comes from, from the 60s with uh, this guy called Malcolm Knowles, an educator, an American educator, who I think he died in the 1990s, late 1990s, right? But he had a huge impact on how we should view adult learning. Because if you think about uh, you know, traditional pedagogy up to the 60s, it was very teacher-centered, very, very, you know, in positive, I would say. Like, kids would, would be told what to do all the time. They had no voice and choice and things like that. And then he started wondering, I don't think adults learn that way effectively because of certain characteristics that adults have. <laughs> and one of the first principles or, you know, uh, uh, assumptions actually is that adults they have something that kids are still forming which is the self-concept mm -hmm. they know who they are they know yeah. what they want mm -hmm. even though that's not really true because we're still looking for meaning in life and <laughs> yes. things like that right but we know much more uh what we want our needs uh, when compared to kids right yeah. and because of that anything goes for kids because you know what they they haven't uh, formed their self-concept yet they yeah. they're still uh, transitioning, you know, uh, w whereas adults are, no, this is not good for me. This is not going to work in my life, yeah. you know, and they have a lot of prior knowledge, which he calls adult learning experience. So that's the second principle that we need to use that. We need to take advantage of that. And the, the three other things, actually four other things he mentions are Readiness to learn, mm -hmm. so they are ready. Yeah. They've gone through all the uh, Piaget's cognitive development, 
uh, you know, uh, stages, right? Mm-hmm. So they are ready. I mean, they're not, uh, let's say, not prepared for a certain thing because it's too complex. No, yeah. we're there yet. We're, we're, we, we've got there. Yeah. And then orientation to learning because now they are, uh, you know, uh, they are going to function in society if they learn certain skills and uh, theories and, and, you know, to apply in their daily jobs or whatever, their, their daily lives. And also there's a lot of motivation to learn mm-hmm. much more. And then there are two types of motivation, intrinsic and extrinsic. It could be my boss wants me to learn English because I'm going to uh, attend conferences or whatever. Yeah. But the fundamental, the key aspect of all of this is relevance. So if you think about kids, they don't care about relevance so much. I mean, of course they do care, but it's not like, Why should I learn this? Where am I going to apply this? When? Kids, they don't really think so much about that all the time. Adults, every minute of every lesson, they might be thinking about that. They might be going like, this is a waste of my time. What this guy is teaching me. What what the hell am I doing here in this group, you know? So that will definitely affect their uh, intrinsic motivation to be there. And then everything can go wrong after that. So yes. basically, those are the principles, right? Yes. And uh, that's why uh, we have to be very careful when we're designing our lesson plans. Because as we design yeah. our lesson plans, we, have to, we do have to think, uh, to think about this. We have to take this into consideration. Is this going to be Definitely, relevant yeah. to my students? I'm teaching adults. Yeah. I'm not teaching kids. When we're teaching kids, there's a different strategy. But come on, guys. We're talking about adult learning today. So adults, sure. they need context. They need relevance. If they think that Most something is yeah. not going to be useful for them, they're going to block it. That's basically why we yep. have a lot of adults today. And when they come to us, the very first thing they say is, I don't like English. I hate English. <laughs> true, true. Why is Unfortunately, that? that's a reality. Yeah. It's a reality, yeah. you know. Even, for, even today, yep. even adults today, they still say this. Uh, I started yep. teaching 18 years ago. I know it doesn't look like that because I look like a kid. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, it's st- you're still developing your prefrontal cortex, right? Oh, it's definitely still forming. It's <laughs> definitely, definitely under development. But <laughs> but uh, 18 years ago, when I started teaching, that's what I heard from adults. And 18 years later, yeah. that's what I still hear from them yeah. when I have them. Oh, I don't like English. Why is sure. that? Because probably yeah. um, when they when they had their first experience learning English as an adult, for instance, yeah. or maybe as a, as a teenager, because remember, teenagers already developed this sense of uh, uh, con- this consciousness. They already developed yeah. that more than kids, of course. They are still developing, but they already know what they sure, like. Yeah. They already know what they want. They already know how to question. They already know they're, uh, okay. they are still developing, like, what's my role in the planet? They, they found their tribes, right? Exactly. Sort of. Exactly. Of course. A lot of things will change, but they, they found their tribes. Yeah, exactly. So Trish said, true. True. What, what, what exactly true? Yeah. Could you elaborate on that, Trish? Yes, yeah. please, Trish, elaborate on, elaborate on this. As we're discussing, we go back to you later. Yeah. And uh, when we're developing yeah. this, when we're developing our lesson plans, we have to take this into consideration and create activities uh, that yes. are not just relevant. It has to be linguistically relevant. And also oh, yes. socially in, uh, relevant. Because remember, yeah. they are going to ask, why do I need to learn this? It's not like, oh, exactly. You know, when, when they ask, why do I need to learn this? It's not just like, oh, because it's English and I have to know this. No, it's because they want <laughs> to apply. They want to use that in real life. So the activities, the, the yeah. way that we're developing our activities are, is really, really important. And if, we th- if we're thinking about the, yeah. full, the full idea of uh, uh, controlled practices, drilling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, please, yeah. guys, don't forget to give our adult learners opportunities for them to actually use the language. This is going to be exactly. really, really important because as we're yeah. drilling, as we're practicing, there's a big chance that they are, in their minds, they're going to be like, okay, but 
I didn't understand why. Do what's I, the point? Yeah, what's the point? I, I what's didn't the get point, it. right? I still don't know yeah. why I need to know this. I still don't know why I need yeah. to know that. Yeah. Then, for instance, I really yeah. like role play activities. You, yeah. You know, and role play. You said something, man. Yeah. And role play activities are really cool because they're going to simulate something that's happening in their real lives. Yeah. And uh, then Definitely. they are going to have that click. Like, oh, that's why I need to learn that. Exactly. Exactly. But so I, I'd like to mention a couple of things because what you said makes a lot of sense. Like. Uh, adults are constantly going to ask why they have to do things, right? <clears throat> they have they have to know the reason behind the drilling or, you know, the control practice or whatever, because we are always making those calculations like cost benefit. Like, you know, why do I have to do this? Where is this going to take me? Uh, isn't there a better way? Maybe there's a better way that works for me or something like that. And I feel like one of the things that I, I included in my dissertation when I was, <laughs> you know, uh, developing the, the, the framework is that it's very important for us to share the goal of the lesson and the goal of the activity. And, and sometimes we don't do that. Uh, you know, sometimes we follow the scope and sequen sequence of a book or when we put together our own resources, our, our own materials, we don't say, listen, we're going to learn this because of this and this and that. And this is the way we're going to do it because this is how it works best. Yeah. And trust me, because I've studied pedagogy and psychology, whatever. Give them your credentials, you know. They should be <laughs> able to trust your decisions, of yes. course. There, and then going back to the and andragogical <laughs> principles, yeah. there should always be room for mm -hmm. negotiation because that's how adults uh, function in the world, right? Yes. And then, of course, you can always do that with kids as well, but it's much more important for adults. And there is one principle in andragogy that places the adult in, in it's like the, the alter ego. We're, we have a friend, Kat, she's going to be with us for the bilingualism course, and she's going to talk about that. Mm -hmm. But think about this alter ego as three different personalities that you have that when you are in the classroom as an adult. So you have this um, authoritative personality that you want to tell the teacher what he or she should do because you know best. You th no, I don't learn like that. I want to do like this. Yes. And then you have this uh, adult alter ego that is, okay, what do you suggest? And then you negotiate and you go like, okay, yeah, this makes sense and whatever. That's how we function. And then you have this kind of kid alter ego that you just accept what the teacher imposes air quotes again here yes. for people listening to us on Spotify <laughs> and we transition from, <laughs> we transition all the time, you know, uh, from, uh, being an authoritative figure to an adult figure and the kid figure, uh, in all our human relations. Right. So this is very interesting because then there are moments that adults are going to be annoying. They're going to say, listen, this is not the way I learn best. And then I say, listen, mm. I studied psychology of education, man. You should trust me. I read a lot of books about this. And then you are going to take your place as the authority figure and say, this is how you learn. I can, I can show you evidence yes. of, of how you learn. But then sometimes they're going to be like, yeah, but shouldn't maybe we do something like that? And then you negotiate. And then yes. they feel like they are co-authors of their learning process, right? Yes. They are they have a say in their learning process. Yes. That's very important for adults. Or at least they're going to have the feeling that they have a say. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, illusions can work as well. <laughs> but um but seriously, and uh, again, going back to the the beginning of this episode when we were talking about yeah. the amount of words that um, an adult conversation generates. Yeah. Uh and again, an adult conversation generates around 500,000 words per week. So imagine yeah. an adult that is already used, that's used to being exposed to these 500,000 words a week. Of course, this is not something that they are going to actually uh, be conscious about. They don't know. Yeah. You don't know. I didn't know up True. until I read that book. 
that we were exposed to about <laughs> I'm kind of shocked years. to be honest. I didn't know that. And yeah. this was and this was a study from the 60s as you said Andre. They, probably we're exposed to much it more. It could be more because we have technology yeah. nowadays. But anyway, so let's use this yeah. number as a basis for this conversation here. Up to half yeah. a million half a million it, it, it <laughs> yeah that's, us, that's huge that's huge it gives more impact so half a yeah. million words a week so this uh, our, our, our uh, students or adult students are already used to that so when we are designing our activities and again give them activities in which they're going to fly solo why is that because they are going to have they, they are going to get the feeling that first yep. this is relevant this is they're going to be like oh this is pretty much what i do at my job for instance or this is pretty much what exactly. i'll do um uh, when i'm talking to a friend or whatever uh yep. they're going to <clears throat> they're going to be able to carry prior knowledge from other from things other than language okay because again yep. again if a person knows how to count from 1 to 500 This person knows how to count from one to uh, from one to five hundred in any language. All we got to do is to make this connection. The ability of exactly. counting uh, the, uh, of counting is never going to be lost. Yeah. Okay. Except for for German, because they, no, I'm kidding. But it's harder in German and and maybe French, I guess. <laughs> Man, you know, I've been I've been watching I've been watching I've been watching a, uh, a series on Netflix, and uh, everything yeah. is uh, from Norway. The actors are from Norway. The language, okay, is from, everything is. Yeah, from, that's from, that's a weird language. Yeah. Man, but it's yeah. so cool. I'm learning a lot of pronunciation. Yeah. That's really cool. Pronunciation. I, yeah, that I, I is cool. Yeah, I that started, is cool. I haven't started uh, analyzing the syntax yet. Yet, but anyway. So yeah. in these activities, this is really important to make our students not only use the language, yeah. but actually use the language in the situation in which they're used to uh, yeah. being exposed to, so that they can transfer exactly. this knowledge, this knowledge that they have to a situation, to a situation. Um, Uh, in where English is spoken, so these activities yeah. are really important for our adult learning. Is it, is it Rita, Jenny, the, the TV series? Oh, the TV series. No, it's uh, Ragnarok. Oh yeah, that's it's really cool. cool. By the way, it's kind of like cool. a Twilight. Yeah. It's Twilight. part of my my heritage. <laughs> yes, you're right. That, that, uh, that's where a headlong comes from. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's a very cool series, okay? It's it makes it's kind of like Twilight, but instead of vampires and wolves, they have um Nordic uh, gods and demi and demigods. Yeah. So it's really cool. But anyway, yeah. so guys, yeah. this is really important. Create exactly. free activities in which our students are yeah. going to use not just the language that we have just uh, practiced and taught, but also yeah. Uh, they are going to use other knowledge or knowledge other than uh, linguistic. Okay, this is really important yeah. for adult students. Yeah. What? So there is there is a very cool question uh, between VIP English School. Yes. What is the best kind of activity to develop students' confidence? Uh, But before, so I no. think I can I can mention one thing. Go ahead. I think one of the things that uh, again is different between kids and adults. Is that they have, and I'm I'm going to be talking about this at the PC in, um, is it July? I think July. Brastiso. Yes, second exactly. weekend of July. It's second or third yeah. weekend. Third weekend of July. S something like that. Third weekend of July. So it's self and co-regulation, and basically, uh, kids they don't know or they can't control their emotional bursts as well as adults. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, that's, you know, that generally speaking, there are some adults who are much more uh, likely to have an outburst than kids. But anyway, uh, it, so because of self-regulation and co-regulation, so co-regulation is me as uh, the middleman, let's say, in the class. Uh, if an adult is doing something they're not supposed to, I can help them regulate as well. So it doesn't come <clears> from them. But it comes from an, an external source, which could be the teacher or, or even a, a peer, a colleague in the, the classroom. Right? Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that adults fear the most, and which is not, it's interesting to relate to how kids learn, 
is exposure.、Mm -hmm. So fear of exposure.、Mm -hmm. So if you want to build students' confidence, I would say, from a psychological, neuroscientific pers perspective, you need to create a welcoming environment. So that's number one. So you have to establish a good rapport with your students and make them feel safe to expose and 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 actually tell them. There's a lot of evidence showing that they can make mistakes in the classroom,、yes. and I, and I have to confess that I don't always do that. That you know sometimes we don't realize that maybe our facial expressions or the tone of our voices or something we say in the classroom can actually negatively affect what what students see. You know, they,、mm -hmm. oh the teacher is making fun of me or or something like that. So this is really hard to control from. From our perspective, I would say,、yes. but also the idea of you know following the the recipe like more controlled practice than freer practice or less controlled practice and freer practice, you build build up their confidence, right? Yes. So allow them to do、yes. something that you know they're going to succeed at,、mm -hmm. so that they can get the the confidence and then do something a little more challenging, a little more challenging, and then something very challenging. So that they can okay, I I got that. This is basically、uh, scaffolding, right? Yes. They're giving them support to get to the to the top of the scaffold and 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 perform, right? Yes.、Uh, my two cents here.、Uh, yes, I totally agree with what you just said, Andre. This is, dude, you hit the jackpot here.、Uh, my two <laughs>、yeah. more cents. My two more cents. My extra credit for you guys is、um, <laughs> two more things. First. Build a connection with your student. This is really、yes. important because then your student is going to trust you, is going to believe in you. Okay. Yeah.、Uh, so this、yep. is the very first thing I'd say, and a very fast, a very fa fast thing to say. My second thing, my second point here, is、um, do again. I'm not getting into cognitive load. We're not getting into that. It's for other episode,、yeah. other episode. But、yeah. don't demand. Maybe the next one. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> But don't demand too、yeah. much on your student because、uh, your student has just learned. Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, perf. Uh, uh, simple. Uh, uh, present. Past perfect. perfect. Yes, past perfect. Yeah. Which is very complicated, or even passive voice, which、yeah. is even more complicated. Passive voice,、yeah. past perfect, something very, very complex. So,、yeah. if you're dealing with this, future perfect. <laughs> exactly, we'll have been doing it.、Um, our students already, our students are already learning how to cope with this new complex thing. So, in the same activity, don't demand that they deal with that with another complex activity in the same thing, because this、yep. this tense, this new tense. Remember, I don't know if you were here.、Uh, no, you got you Twin、uh, VIP English School. You were here from the beginning, so probably you you were、yeah. here when we were talking about short and long term memory and how new things start being stored. It's it's there is a storage for this before it becomes、yeah. a、um, uh, long term memory. So our kids, our kids, the adults are going to get this new tense. And it's going to be stored. They're not going to. They're not going to be reasoning that. Of course, in a very simplistic way. And if、yeah. you ask, if you demand that they cope with a very complex activity at the same time, so both are going to be in the in the short term memory, and that's too much for them. Yeah. Too much for them to cognitive、retrieve. overload. Yeah, you know that's too much for cognitive them. Cognitive overload. Okay,、yeah. and they're going to feel frustrated, and this is going to、yeah. uh, this is going to、uh, have a consequence. What you know, they're going to be blocked. They're going to be frustrated. They're going to be like, I don't like English.、Yeah. I don't want to teach that anymore. So these are my two yes、uh, final cents here for what Andre just said. I I I like that. I'll add just one more thing that you know the feeling of frustration is not necessarily bad.、Mm -hmm. So I remember reading a lot of、um, so, but we, of course we have to be careful. But reading a lot of studies on how、um, the release of cortisol, which is the the stress、mm -hmm. neurotransmitter, if、mm -hmm. if you may, you know, can actually make you more alert and pay more attention and even remember things more. So, but the thing. We have to be very careful. Is the level of frustration and the level of challenge, right? And we have to be 
uh, we have to convey the message in the classroom. Yes. That there is something that Robert Bjork, is a, a great professor from uh, California, he calls desirable difficulties, kind of like going to the gym, working out. If you don't feel that, that pain, there is no gain, right? So if you, you have to feel that, that the fumes coming out of your head, like you're really <laughs> making the effort yeah. so that you're learning. It's, yeah. it, it's not supposed to be easy, just easy all the time. So building up our students' confidence is great, but they have to realize that making effort and going through difficult periods throughout the, the, the learning <clears throat> process is actually good for them. Yes. They're re reinforcing a lot of the connections in their brains, right? Because so the, just be, tell them that. Because when, <laughs> yeah. because when they overcome this difficulty, they're going to have a sense of achievement like, I did it. It was hard. Exactly. The struggle was real, exactly. but I overcame it. You know, so they are going yes. to feel well. And this is going to have a huge impact because they are going to remember that. Exactly. Event. And they are going to be like. Sense of achievement. You know, yeah. oh, and then when they are going to face, when they face another challenge, they are going to remember that. Yeah. And they are going to feel more confident, confident for the next challenge. Like, oh, wait yeah. a minute. The first challenge I did this, 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 and that. So maybe I'll try to do the very same thing and I'll be successful again because I like that feeling. Yeah. I overcame it, you know. Maybe exactly. it's not going to work, but if it's not going to work, it's not that it's not going to work from scratch. It's going to work from, you yeah. know, halfway up there. So this is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. And Vinicius said something important. Uh, he, that's why we create routines for kids to reduce anxiety and make them feel a sense of control about what's going to happen. Definitely. And even for adults, you know, mm -hmm. uh, of course, adults are much better prepared to face Uh, adversity and you know unexpected situations but i think there there should be a protocol like a routine that we follow uh, the good the good routine the good protocol yeah. otherwise we don't do things we need to s systematize things as thinking beings you know what's going to happen next what's going to happen next and and but the sense of the unexpected is also very important mm -hmm. for both kids and adults you know the sense of 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 wonderment of you know Oh, this is cool. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going to keep the classroom interesting. That what it's going to keep bringing novelty into the classroom yes. and make them want to be there even more, right? Exactly. And I think our time is almost yes. up, right? Yes. Rudy. Guys. Yes. Oh man. We're almost up. Uh so guys, I would like from the bottom of my heart to thank you all for joining us. I think it was really really cool. I hope you had the same feeling. It was definitely cool. And yeah. uh, thank you so much for joining us. If you <laughs> joined us from the mid part on uh, this uh, Shop It Everywhere, yeah. this episode is going to be on IGTV on both accounts, mine and yeah. EDC Rocks from Andre here. And it's also going yep. to be fully on Spotify. So guys, go to Spotify. Find us on Spotify. We're going to be there. It's going to yeah. be there forever. It's going to be on IGTV. Janaki. Thank you. Thank you. It was amazing. I learned a lot. Thank you, guys. Thank well, you, guys. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining I, I, us. Like, like Rudy said, it's going to be available on Spotify and IGTV. And again, uh, we love doing this. You know, yes. It's good for us. Excellent cognitive exercise. Exactly. And we're super happy that you're joining <laughs> us. And you know what? Give us some ideas of things you want us to talk about. Yes. Because we... You know, we pretend that we know everything that we can talk about <laughs> any subject, but we actually study a little before we talk about anything. Oh, That's yeah. great for us too, right? Oh, yeah. Man. So, guys, thank you so much. Andre Hedlund, my good friend, thank you so much. See you guys. <laughs> thank you, Rudy. I'm going to I'm gonna visit you pretty soon in yes. Campinas, right? I'm waiting, man. I have a connection there. Okay. I'm waiting. Guys, thank you so much. Have a great final end of uh, Sunday. See you. Bye-bye. Yeah. See you guys. Have fun. Don't drink and drive, okay? Bye-bye. <laughs>